Tigers are powerful creatures, and they also hold grudges. Today's story is all about that. Today, we're traveling deep into the arboreal forest of the Russian Far East's taiga. Primori is a region in Russia with undulating topography and the world's largest undammed river, the Amur. The area's wildlife is a murderous row of some of the world's most lethal predators – caribou, moose, elk, deer, and the extremely hazardous wild boar – are all prey for these predators. Incredibly, some people can make a life here just on the abundance of dangerous animals. Vladimir Markov, a poacher, was going and poaching and he loaded up his gear to head out to his secluded lodge in the dead of winter in 1997. He spent a lot of time there, since finding work is difficult. But a brave and resourceful man can catch enough fish and trap enough to get by. Markov kissed his wife farewell and had a buddy drive him away from his home in Luchigursk, and down maybe 50 kilometers on the most challenging road imaginable. As he was about to settle down for the night to go hunting in the morning, Markov and his pal packed his goods into the cabin. Markov awoke early the next day, grabbing his rifle and walking out of his door. Although the temperatures were considerably below zero, he was unfazed. He and his hounds weren't hunting for anything specific. Instead, they were looking for what he might sell on the illicit market. Meat from deer or boars, as well as pelts from wolves, leopards, and even, even tigers could be used. Tigers and leopards are legally protected, yet they bring in a lot of cash to the Chinese markets on the south. While walking through the forest with his dogs, they found a massive trace of a male Siberian tiger. Well, this was the chance he'd been waiting for. The group followed the trails for a few kilometers, winding through dense vegetation and over hills. The gang could see the enormous cat's tracks in the snow as a pursued wild boar was near, and they had known that the cat was tracking the boar. As Markov approached the end of the route, he noticed the muscles ripple across the cat's shoulders as it hunched over its recent prey and glared at the guy, indicating it was not about to give it his prize. Markov raised his shotgun and fired at the cat, confident in his accuracy because his livelihood depended on it, and the cat flew across the white birch forest, disappearing from view. He was confident that he had gravely wounded the tiger, and now had a bonus that he could reap. He strolled up to the boar the tiger was eating and began slicing off some of the fresh meat for himself. Markov retrieved a significant amount of flesh from the boar carcass and moved on to the tiger, which he assumed would be dead over the hill. He discovered the cat's massive tracks in the snow when started tracing each step as he found it. The fresh snow made it easier, but he noted that the blood trail seemed to fade as he followed it. A few miles after following the tracks, the blood in the tracks came to a halt. He recognized the tiger was severely injured, but he would not be able to catch up to it. He redirected his journey back to his cabin and the warmth that it had provided. Before returning the next day to hunt, he'd used part of the saved meat to feed the dogs and himself. When he returns to his cabin, he places one of the hunches from the boar in his beehive's whale head and takes the other to town to see what he can exchange it for. He makes it back to the cabin just before nightfall, trading for some much-needed provisions for his camp and more ammunition for his shotgun. While Markov was in town, the wounded tiger returned to his boar kill and scented the man's and his dog's scents, and the fact that most of his meat had been removed. He follows the man's footsteps for a long time, and a few hours later, in the dead of night, he discovers the cached hind haunch from his kill which Markov had stashed in the beehive wellhead. The tiger crushes the wellhead out of rage and reclaims his boar meal. He drags it a short distance away from the cabin and he consumes it. The tiger is dissatisfied with how things went down and with the fact that he had gotten his meat back. He quietly pads down to the cabin and carefully wanders around it, assessing the situation. When Markov's dogs start barking nonstop, he thinks something's wrong outside. Markov pauses for a good look at the camp before deciding to address the problem with a well-placed shot. 
Markov takes the rifle and enters the cabin with his dogs. His cabin is equipped with firing ports, allowing him to pierce the wall with his gun barrel and to fire outside. He shoots the tiger with his shotgun through the shooting port. After being injured twice by the same guy, the gigantic cat vanishes into the jungle once more. The fact that the tiger showed up at Markov's cabin the next day and refused to go frightened him. It certainly retrieved the wild boar's hind haunch and returned to his cabin afterward. As a result, its actions were not motivated by food. These particulars threw him into a psychological story. In the Far East, tigers are thought to behave in a vindictive and calculated manner. Locals say that people harbor grudges and they seek vengeance. Long after events have occurred, Markov decides to leave the tiger and travel to a friend's cabin in the hopes of catching a ride back to town in safety. As the radiator fluid has been drained from his vehicle, his friend Duncha tries to persuade him to remain in his cabin for the night. Because the temperatures are too cold to leave it in, this must be done every night. Markov regains his composure and decides not to wait with his buddies. He returns to his cabin and resolves to deal with the tiger the only way he knows how, by shooting and killing it. The tiger broke into Markov's cabin by destroying the door while he was gone. The man's scent was all about the cabin and the cat chewed, clawed, and bit anything that reeked of him. He finds a well-hidden position and waits for Markov over the trail to the cabin when he finishes ransacking the cabin. The fight didn't last long, as the now-resolved Markov approaches his own cabin in the dark. The tiger ambushes him from a well-hidden blind beneath a low-hanging spruce bough. At the nexus where the tiger and the man's tracks met, detectives would find a horrifying scene with the surrounding snow saturated in blood. From the snow, a single dog leg protrudes. The snow had been stamped down into a circle and melted away in the middle, with a human femur picked clean of flesh. A bloody drag path leads to another circle that had been wiped out, where they discover the rest. The tiger is pacified for a few days by feeding on the guy, after which it departs. Over the next three days, the tiger makes its way downstream, slowly recovering from its infected wounds. As it approaches a tiny camp frequented by Markov, it detects his scent on the outhouse and shatters the entire structure, harming itself more. Poachers, miners, and lumberjacks have all fled the taiga since the residents had learned of the tiger. Andre, a 25-year-old trapper, is the sole exception to this rule. Andre's parents told him he couldn't check his traps until the tiger was caught or killed, but he disobeyed them. And that's exactly what caused his death by the claws of the tiger. The tiger feasted on him for three days, devouring practically all of Andre's flesh. The men collected the meager remains and returned to inform his mother, which might fit in a huge shirt pocket. Project Tiger is a group of tiger researchers and law enforcement officers financed by Western conservation organizations, who operate in a similar manner to park rangers, but without the need for a park. They establish checkpoints and information centers to inform residents about the tiger and how to be safe. And then they put together a six-man professional hunting team to begin chasing the tiger and to save human lives. The hunters followed the limping tiger's tracks to Andre's cabin in early December. When they discovered everything was in shambles, the tiger had continued to lash out at everything that smelled like a human. They then followed him across the mountains, observing his footprints as he unsuccessfully sought game after game. Officers Shibnif and Pionka flanked the head tracker, who was named Yuri Trush. The hunters tailed the tigers, and as he returned to a more secluded region near a cabin, they began to hunt. Officer Trush turned towards the location as the hunting party enters a clearing near the cabin, and a tremendous roar shakes the men's bones. The yell was emitted as he watched the enormous cat rush toward him at a distance of about 20 feet. Trush notices the tiger's fierce, angry glare focused on him like lasers during the adrenalized slow-motion period. While the cat was closing in on him, Trush was able to fire two shots from his weapons, while the other officers fired a total of 11 shots. The giant was no longer alive. To ease worries, the dead tiger was loaded into a car and then driven back to the hamlet. The cat was malnourished and had a huge head. When the men skinned the tiger, they discovered that it had been injured by more than Markov's two rounds. The tiger had been shot multiple times before and even had several lead pellets implanted in its flesh from the larger shot. 
the tiger was about to mature and will be stuffed and shown at the administrative offices later. Thank you for watching.